At the beginning of March, I gave away two free weathering commissions when I hit 1,000 subscribers. Here's how the first one turned out. A red-covered hopper gets its share of dark grime, coming up on JC's Rip Track. Hi there, my name is John and welcome to JC's Rip Track. If this is your first time here and you're looking for advice and tips on how to transform your plastic models into something that looks like it belongs on the rails today, then click on subscribe and that little bell icon so you can be notified every time there's a new video. So is there one particular color that you find hard to weather? Let me know in the comments section down below. When I held my 1,000 subscriber giveaway draw back in March, the two prizes that I offered were a service rather than something physical. The idea was for the winners to send me one of their models and I would then weather it for them and film the process for a future video. Well, this is that future video for the runner-up prize, a bright red covered hopper. It had a weathering pattern that I had never done before and so it was a great challenge and a lot of fun to do. I even got to use pan pastels for the first time. During the process, I posted progress shots and notes of both pieces on my new Patreon page, which you may have seen, but this video now shows that process from start to finish. And so here's how it went. This is a nicely detailed unit from Tangent Scale Models. The prototype it is based on was once owned by Delaware and Hudson and is now owned by the Atel Leasing Corporation with the road name of ATGX. I did the research along with Justin, drawing from the railroad picture archives. This was a real challenge for the model as how an originally bright red piece of rolling stock faded or darkened in a very different way. In fact, that patchy darkened red would be what I call the signature look for that particular model. Get that part right and it will go a long way in making a convincing weathered model. Now red is a difficult color to get right when weathering. Unlike black, which tends to lighten into various gray tones, red can go pink, it can go orange, it can go peach, or it can go to various dark tones like this one did. So early on in the process, I had to figure out how I was going to approach it. As you'll see, I ended up testing and then using some techniques that were new to me. As with my previous efforts, I kept referring back to the prototype photos to check my work. The first step, as with almost any weathering project, was to remove the trucks so that I could paint them and get access to the underside of the car. This is fairly straightforward. I used a small screwdriver and then placed the trucks, wheel sets and screws into a small plastic container. And I set these aside and would work with them much later in the process. In the prototype, the black lettering on the shield logo of the car had partially worn away. Handling this was pretty straightforward. I matched the yellow by mixing some of the acrylic yellow colors that I had on hand, and then I very lightly sponged it over where these chips would be. The next step was nearly identical, but this time I would be using red that I had matched to the paint to chip the logo, the letters, and the safety striping down to the red base paint. Sponge chipping is a very easy and quick way to do this, but it is also easy to overdo it. As you can see in the picture, I kept the prototype pictures very close at hand and you can actually see me using my iPhone to zoom in on the logo and the letters. Since the next step was going to be a light fade with the airbrush, I first masked off the gray roof hatches. Normally this wouldn't be necessary, but since the fade that I was doing involved a mix of yellow and white, I didn't want these top hatches to pick up a yellow tinge. When it came time to do the fade, I used a 1 to 1 to 1 mix of AK Interactive's Real Colors Flat White, Yellow and Satin Varnish to produce a translucent yellow tinged fade. I then thinned the whole mix with a 91% isopropyl alcohol. I lightly sprayed this over all the surfaces of the model, but kept concentrations towards the top. On the bottom, I sprayed below the hatches, allowing for some overspray to catch the bottom of the hatches without putting too much on it. This light yellow fade pushed the red towards an orange color without also fading the lettering. Even then, the satin varnish would then help set things up for the next step with the dot fading. 
Now I opted to give the car a straight satin coat, this time using AK Interactive Satin Varnish thinned down with 91% alcohol. I wanted to make sure that the whole model had a good satin coat in order to receive the oils. I prepared the oils for both this covered hopper as well as the Rock Island locomotive that you'll see in the next video. The colors I used were zinc white, parchment, cadmium yellow, cadmium red, coagulated blood, and that's a color from Abtolung 502's light rust and viridian green. While most of these colors might make sense, the reason that I chose green is that it is a contrasting color to the red and would help darken it on the model. Once the dot fading is done, the green all but disappears. The contrast and the tinting of the base coat becomes apparent though. When applying the dots, I started with the lightest color at the top of the model and then worked my way down, getting darker as I went. I mostly used the yellowish parchment color and cadmium yellow. Once I applied all the dots, I then blended them using a flat brush wet with thinner and brushed it in a downward motion. The main thing to remember is to make the dots just disappear. Once it had dried, it gave a subtle worn look, enhancing the earlier airbrush fade. Off camera, I gave the car a coat of acrylic gloss varnish to protect the oil work in order to set up for the pin washes. My choice of color for the pin wash was Make Productions Dark Wash. This is a very dark brown and it would bring out the details nicely. Unlike the dot fade, I started at the bottom of the model and I lightly wet the surface with odorless mineral spirits as a thinner and then touch the details using a very small brush, allowing the enamel wash to flow nicely around the details. I used the same color wash on the gray top hatches to make some of the details pop. Of course, oil-based pin washes need a second step of blending or smoothing the wash about 20 minutes later. I would alternately use a small flat brush dampened with thinner and a larger filberts type brush. I also used a larger flat brush as well as a paper towel as needed to get the blend right. The main thing that I was trying to do was to make sure that there were no lines or tide marks that would look artificial. Blending and smoothing is the name of the game when working with oils and enamels. The next major step was to chip away the paint in the upper walkways of the car. From the prototype pictures that looked down on the car, it was clear that these were made from aluminum. Unlike steel, aluminum oxidizes to a gray color. Whatever red rust one might find on aluminum will have come from iron or a steel bolt. So the walkway oxidizes and then the paint flakes away, leaving these large gray areas of chipped paint. I used lighter gray acrylic paints, trying to match the prototype color. It was a mix of Games Workshop's Dawnstone and Administratium Grey. Using a sponge lightly dabbed in the color, I dabbed it across the walkway, trying to avoid contact with any part of the main model or the top hatches, even though they were also grey.
The next step also involves some brushwork. To match the prototype, the hinges, the bands, the bolts, and the other bits and pieces on the top hatch were distinctive rusted metal color. So using a very fine brush, I carefully painted these first with Mornfrang Brown, and then after I had finished applying that, I then used Scrag Brown to create a lighter mottled rust appearance in a few places. This next part was something that I was both afraid of, but was looking forward to trying. You may remember my tests of pan pastels on plastic spoons and knives several weeks ago. This is why I was experimenting with it, because the dark grimy fade on this particular car was very distinctive, and I decided to turn to pan pastels as the first step in trying to achieve this signature look for the model. A critically important part of applying pan pastels is that they need to be done over a matte coat, the flatter the coat, the better. The main reason is that the pan pastels are designed to be applied over surfaces with a texture or tooth. Smooth or satin coats will not do here. And while I had experimented with the pan pastels, this would be the first model that I would be applying them to. So I decided to start with the underside of the model. I used both a brush and the supplied sponge to apply them. Keeping the reference photos nearby, I started with the raw umber extra dark, but I would also be using extra dark versions of raw sienna and red iron oxide. These come in a dark earth tone color set, and I will explain a little bit more about pan pastels and how they work in a separate video, but this hopefully gives you a good idea of how I use them. After applying a few test spots with the sponge, I then started moving systematically over the model. I experimented as I went. They really do go on better with a sponge, but the brushes do work as well. One major feature of pan pastels is that you can remove them after you apply them with a basic pencil eraser. So I could go back and then use this eraser to take them off places where I didn't want it, such as the safety striping or the gray patches of the, where the new road numbers were. I could also draw the eraser down through places that I had applied and then blend it a bit with a brush or a fresh sponge to soften the edges. This has a real potential to create a soft streaked effect. Now the drawback to this feature is that it does mean that pan pastels can be rubbed off if you're not careful. So they do need to be sealed or protected with a clear coat. Otherwise it will come off on your fingers. Pigment fixtures can work with this, but I've also learned that an acrylic clear coat like Future can protect them well, or at least it works well with the dark colors that I used. As a caution, don't use lacquer clear coats like a spray can clear, as that may fade the applied pan pastels. I worked my way across both sides of the models, but I knew that I would need to do a little bit more using of oil colors. And using Future as an acrylic clear coat, I set things up for the next step. Now the pan pastels worked, but the dark staining on this model needed something a little bit more. In this case, I would use the oil paints for this next step, primarily my old standby of Atulung 502 Starship Filth, along with dark rust that would be used for some subtle streaking along the way. The intention was not to replace what I had already done with the pan pastels, but rather enhance the work that I had already done. This is a good example of using two different techniques together to create an effect, rather than relying on a single trick. 
This gives it a more natural appearance and brought it closer to the prototype. I applied the oils by placing a few dots on the model in strategic places where I wanted to enhance the dark grime. I then used a variety of brushes to soften and blend them across the surface of the model. This is a different approach than streaks because I'm trying to get a blended look. In all, this dark grime really represented a little more than a third of the time spent on this model, but it was well worth it. Once I let the oil paints dry, I then came back with a flat, clear coat. Now it was time to come back to the trucks. Off camera, I painted the trucks using a spray can of Rust-Oleum Camouflage Earth Brown. And kudos to Ralph Renzetti and Ron Marsh for suggesting this. It works as advertised and is a kind of paint and primer all in one, and it sticks very well to Delrin type plastics. Starting with this Earth Brown as a base, I then used Games Workshop's Mornfang Brown to carefully paint the springs. I then took a sponge and lightly sponged the same color across the main body of the trucks to simulate rust. Painting the wheel sets, I decided to brush paint using Steinle Res Red Brown Primer. This was as much to see how well it would work as these are primarily geared for airbrushing. And we've definitely found a winner here. This brushed on the surface of the metal wheels very nicely. Now coming back to the main body of the car, I wanted to add a tiny amount of graffiti to match the prototype. The truth is, I couldn't tell who applied them. They certainly weren't the type of elaborate works of graffiti writers that you'd expect, and they didn't look like tags either. They almost seemed to be something that rail workers may have added, hearkening back to the days of chalk marks. I applied these using a white gel pen, knowing that the final layer of dust would tone it down a little bit. Keeping the prototype photos handy, I went through and matched the markings for one side of the car as similar marks aren't present on the opposite side with the prototype photos. The last step before assembling it all was to give both the car and the trucks a light layer of dust. Using a one-to-one -one mix of Tamiya Flat Earth and Buff, I lightly sprayed this over the trucks and then over the model that sat upside down on my spray stand. I then added a little bit more by laying the car on each side, but this was a very light touch. And finally, I put the trucks back on the car and assembled the model and it was ready for some pictures and its trip back to Justin. In all, it took about four hours and 20 minutes to complete. I have to say that I really enjoyed this project. The weathering pattern was different from a lot of the types of things that I had already done, and I had to find a way to get the signature look for this piece. Commissions like this have the major benefit of providing me with something outside of my own collection, and so it forces me to either stretch my existing techniques, or as in this case, to try something entirely new. 
So I do hope you found this helpful. The major takeaway from this project is to focus on a signature look for a given piece. And whether it is a certain bit of chipping, a particular streak or wear pattern, or the unique grime like on this model. As I've said before, get the signature look right and everything else falls into place. So if you want more tips on how to get the most of your painting and weathering projects, don't forget to hit subscribe and that little bell icon so you won't miss any upcoming videos. If you like seeing how Justin's commission went and you want a chance to see how one of your own might look, go check out my Patreon page and you can get involved in the creative process for this channel. Also, if you haven't already, check out the other videos on this channel as well as some of the social media links down below. So thanks so much for watching. Good luck and may you keep on track.